Hi, you're watching Saturday in the Woodworking Shop with Andrew Pitts, where we talk things woodworking. You remember my friend Sarah, who had the table where I had to try to match the mahogany to look like the mystery wood, or I guess I had to match the mystery wood to look like the mahogany. Well, she's got another table here. This time she just wants me to refinish the top. Uh, top was kind of beat up. Looks the same color as the sides here. I've already been doing some sanding on here. We'll sand it on down and then uh, probably put on a little stain, try to darken it a little bit, and then I suspect I'll use a varnish finish. Now, you know, I'm really debating whether to uh, stain it or not, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little experiment here with some water. I'm going to go ahead and saturate this with water, and that will also help me raise the grain, by the way, and I can sand that off. But that will also give me an idea of what the color would be if I just used finish. Maybe a, a shellac coat, and then the varnish. The shellac being to kind of seal it up so that you don't get uneven penetration of the varnish. Right, let me go ahead and wipe that in evenly. That really darkens it up, just the finish itself. I think I'm just going to go ahead and try to just uh, use a, uh, a little shellac seal and then some varnish. And of course that's going to darken a little bit over time as well. And the varnish is going to give it a little bit more darkness. But I think that will uh, actually look good. Well here it is. I think it turned out pretty nice. I used uh, three coats, I used a, a, a wash coat of shellac and then three coats of a satin varnish and, uh, and then I put a couple of coats of Brie Wax on there, that's what gives it a little bit of gloss, I think that's going to die down a little bit, we'll get back to the softer look, but you know, I cleaned up, with that, uh, cleaned up the legs and the apron with a little denatured alcohol and then just put on a, a couple of thin coats of shellac just to bring them up a little bit and I think it turned out nice. I received an email from a fellow who uh, is from uh, northern Illinois and uh, he was going to be out uh, this this way visiting family. He wanted to know if he could come by the shop. I said great come on by. His name is Steve Bonte. Uh, he's, a, he's a retired electrical engineer. He's built his own CNC machine using a MDF, a regular uh, threaded rod that you get at the hardware store, stepper motors, uh, angle iron for the tracks. He says it works pretty good so showed me some pictures of his work. It was, it was good. Um, nice, uh, seemed to be a nice precision. So uh, great. And uh, so anyway I showed him around the shop. He brought me a little gift here. Some uh, Wisconsin beer from uh, Glarus Brewery. There's a selection of, uh, of, of you know, four different beers here. He's obviously seen my videos where I show all my beer bottle collections, so I, I thank you, Steve, for that. I'm going to be teaching a class up in uh, Peters Valley School of Craft here in a few days. It'll be an intro to CNC routing, and uh, one of the things that I'm going to teach about is uh, using a wedge jig for a hold down. And so one of the class projects is going to be to make this jig. All it really is is it's a uh, rectangle of, uh, in my case, plywood, but you could use MDF, something stable. And uh, like I say, it's, it's kind of a rectangle on the inside, except it's got a four degree slope on the top part here that fits in here with a wedge. And so the wedge has a four degree slope on it as well. And when you drive it on home, you can not wedge a nice piece of work in there. And it's really fast for uh, changing your work pieces. So the way this wedge jig works, I've lined it up so I, uh, I've made it so I can line it up with the zero zero point on the spoil board. And the corner of the jig is the two X equals two Y equals two point. So that works really nice. To make sure that I get it in the right place every time, I've actually cut indexing pins into the design. So I use quarter inch dowels and just put them in there. And then all I've got to do is simply screw this on down to the spoil board so it doesn't go anywhere when I'm cutting. Okay, so I want to show you how easy it is to use this wedge hold down. 
I've got a blank here that I've cut. It's 3 and 11 sixteenths wide by 15 and an eighth inch long. And uh, all I have to do is slide it on in there, put the wedge in, use my little tack hammer to, to seat this, and I'm ready to carve. The nice thing about this is if I'm doing a run of, uh, say, many uh, paperweights like you saw in the previous video, I can do one cut with one bit in all the blanks. Instead of changing the bit for every blank, which takes a long time, I can simply cut the, say, the crab in the paperweight, then knock that out, vacuum out the dust, stick a new blank in there, and I'm ready to carve. I can go through a whole bunch of blanks and then change the bit, do the lettering, go through the same routine, and it really does save a lot of time. You know, things don't always go as smoothly in the shop in real life as they do in a video, and I sometimes talk about mindfulness when you're working, just keeping your concentration on what you're doing and not letting yourself getting rushed or uh, let your mind wander. And here's a great example. I was cutting out a round uh, profile cut on a plaque and the plaque thickness was 1.12 inches thick. Now I usually, when I'm doing a cutout with a profile cut, I'll add about five thousandths so I should have set my software file up to be 1.125 deep cut. Well, again, my mind's racing and I set the software for 1.2 instead of 1.12. So therefore, I was already cutting another 0 .08, what would that be, 80 thousandths? deeper than I should have cut and here it is right there in the spoil board you can see the cut went too deep now I could go ahead and do the table resurfacing routine using a half inch flat you know straight cutter and cut this on down to get rid of that but you know I'm gonna leave it because that's gonna be my reminder that if you hurry and don't think all the time in the workshop you're gonna make mistakes this is a fairly inexpensive mistake you know I cut into the spoil board a little it doesn't really affect anything I can keep using the spoil board but you can just imagine the other things that could happen in the shop if you let your mind wander so I'll go ahead and keep that reminder until uh, my normal resurfacing obliterates it and that probably won't be for quite a while as part of that class uh, I asked the, the folks down at ShopBot if they could give me some of these little mouse pads that uh, you know comes with a new ShopBot because it's really useful. I can give it to my students. It's got a fraction list of fractions along the side here, and it's the accompanying uh, decimal equivalents. So it's really handy when you're working with uh, with your uh, modeling software and, and so forth to be able to uh, quickly. Uh, you know, calculate the decimal equivalents, equivalents for these fractions, but not calculate them, but, you know, find them using this little table. So I thought that'd be really nice. They also sent me a bunch of thumb drives here, which are great because you can run your program for design on one computer and then put it on a thumb drive and run it on over to the other, um, to the other computer that's driving your machine. So I thank ShopBot for that. I think it's going to really be a nice uh, addition to the course. And by the way, um, I don't know if there's still time to sign up for the course or not, but uh, it's at Peters Valley School of Craft. It's called Intro to uh, CNC Routing. And I think we start on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, no, we start on Friday and uh, goes five days. Mm -hmm.